evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to tonight's event, a presentation by David Cortin entitled On Relationality in Housing and Design. My name is Robert Levitt, and I'm the acting dean of the faculty. I want to thank you all very much for being here with us tonight. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. As many of you may know, the name of the avenue in which our faculty sits, Spadina, came from Anishinaabe, from the Anishinaabe word, Ishpadina, and means a place on a hill. The site was also part of an important trail for several First Nations. As an institution, we're committed to promoting truth and reconciliation, and we note this history and wish to honor these connections as we move forward collectively. And I've said this before, but I'll repeat that personally, I'm especially grateful to be in this place where history is being recognized and truth is being sought. Since moving to Canada from the US some years ago now, my own consciousness about what has transpired here and across Turtle Island has been significantly heightened, and I'm grateful for this awareness and for the opportunity to contribute in whatever ways I can to the long process of reconciliation. And now for uh, tonight's proceedings. Understanding the limitations of design can be productively reframed as a way of opening up possibilities. Tonight's talk by architect and academic David Fortin, member of the Métis Nation of Ontario, will present a series of discussion points surrounding current housing challenges, how they are impacting both Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, and why they encourage reflection on what design is and who it serves. David's talk will feature the Architects Against Housing Alienation Project, Not For Sale currently on view in the Canada Pavilion at the Venice Architecture Biennale. David is a member of the AAHA, which curated the pavilion for 2023. Some more about David, who is an architect, a professor at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture and the first indigenous person to direct an architecture school in Canada. David's research investigates the instrumentality of the design process in influencing how we see our futures with a particular focus on indigenous voices and agency. A member of the RAIC Indigenous Task Force, seeking ways to foster and promote indigenous design in Canada, David also leads a small design firm working closely with communities to realize their visions. In addition to this year's Venice Biennale project, David was co-curator with Gerald McMaster of Unseated Voices of the Land Canada's entry to the Venice Biennale in 2018. So following David's presentation, we'll have 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A. So please help me in welcoming David to the stage. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Tanche, hi everybody. Um, thank you very much for the introduction uh, and thank you to the committee who invited me to be here. Um, so I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna get to AHA uh, later on in the talk and it's gonna seem like a bit of a detour to get there but uh, one of the things that um, uh, I think AHA, as you know, is a committee of six people that came together for the Venice Biennale specifically and our work continues. Uh, and each of us kind of have our own journeys and stories on to why we ended up in this uh, place working together. And so this is a bit of kind of a personal journey and, and to describe sort of my thinking on what alienation means. Uh, and I changed the title a little bit and you'll see why in a second, um, which is towards a critical relationality. So in some ways, the first part of this talk is I've, I've been reflecting a lot recently in my own um, career where we are as architects, where we are as indigenous peoples, where we are as Métis people, uh, and trying to think about where, how we're navigating down this, this river together. This is an image by students that are working on the, the AHA project right now. 
So uh, it's important to position myself in this conversation whenever, we, whenever I'm speaking, particularly on indigenous issues. Uh, first thing I want to do is honor my mom's family. She is a second generation Canadian Austrian. And so I always feel so bad because whenever I'm talking about issues, I like, I'm, I'm never talking about Austrian you know, uh, uh, architects. But um, I'm mainly talking about my dad's family. Uh, this is my Whitford family. Um, and we are Métis, Red River Métis, uh, who migrated across the prairies and settled mostly in northern Alberta and northern BC. Uh, my dad's in the bottom left image in the, in the bottom left uh, here. Uh, and uh, he's sitting, standing next to my uncle, Ed Whitford, who was actually chief of Halfway River First Nation. Um, so even though we're all Métis, um, in parts of Canada, um, there's strong relations between First Nations and, and Métis people. And I include this book because my dad was an educator, uh, and he's featured in this book uh, for his work. Um, in, towards the end of his career, he was really looking at um, Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination over education, specifically with reserves in Alberta. So I often say to him he was like 30 years uh, ahead of his time because he would have had many more uh, listening ears than he did back then. But I grew up sort of in an atmosphere of people talking about indigenous self-determination and my dad being an advocate for that. My architectural career started off uh, sort of on many, in many different facets. So this is the last project that I worked on as an intern many years ago in Calgary. This is a 15, well, at the time it was $15 million for a family of four, kids that were like three and five at the time. Um, and, uh, and that was the last project I worked on before I did a PhD, which I won't talk about, but that was in science fiction and looking at the domestic space of the future and thinking about what home means as we move forward into the future. And then when I started teaching, I did a lot of work in Kenya. Um, bumped into Aziza at the time uh, at World Urban Forums and talking about basically housing justice. Um, and but those years were very formative for me in a sense because uh, you can imagine the extremes and trying to figure out a how just from a human perspective this was okay um, and then beyond just kind of having that kind of shocking realization of the disparity in the world but what are the systems in place that make that possible and I can't say I figured it out yet but I think I would say that most of my career since then has been trying to understand the systems that make this kind of disparity possible. And part of that was understanding my own Métis heritage. So I, I did a research project when I first moved back to Canada in 2013 to ask, you know, I'd always been Métis and I'd always been an architect, but I'd never asked really or been able to understand what does it mean to be a Métis architect. So the question mark was very intentional and in some ways many is or still is. Um, and as part of that, I wrote this paper with a student of mine at the time who's now an architect as well, Jason Serkin. Uh, towards an architecture of Métis resistance, very much informed by Kenneth Frampton and talking about uh, critical regionalism, understanding what a Métis voice would be within that conversation. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, I guess in context for today's talk, I also want to just acknowledge that today, uh, Indigenous is in. Uh, and it's not just here. I just got back from Australia from a talk there in Melbourne. Uh, it's very similar conversations happening here. Most federal projects, most municipal projects, uh, there's either a requirement for Indigenous design, Indigenous consultation. So uh, the architectural world has shifted dramatically from 10 years ago. I used to be one of the people on a soapbox saying we need to talk to Indigenous people on our public projects. And now here we are. Um, and mostly I think this is great because this is what I, I frame as indigenous presencing. It's a reminder of people where we are and whose land you're on, and there's no reason why when you get off a plane in Toronto, it should look just like a city in Calgary. You're on two totally different nations' territory, and why are we not recognizing that in our environment? So this is definitely a positive thing. But I'm also very haunted daily, weekly, every time I do this talk, uh, of this quote from the Hawaiian um, theorist, uh, Poka Lueni, when he's talking about processes of decolonization. And in this paper, he's talking about what is the last stage when indigenous people have been totally taken over by colonial society. So this is it, the final chapter for indigenous people, and let me read it with you. He said, the traditional culture that simply refuses to die or go away is now transformed into the culture of the dominating colonial society. Indigenous art that has survived may gain in popularity and form the basis for economic exploitation. Indigenous symbols and print may decorate modern dress. Indigenous musical instruments may be incorporated into modern music. Supporting indigenous causes within the general colonial structure may become the popular political thing to do, exploiting the culture further. 
this exploitation may be committed by indigenous as well as non-indigenous people. So like when you're working so much in this space, I always like to go back to this, this quote and just stop for a minute and say like, do we actually know what we're doing here? Like, does everyone actually understand what's happening and are we doing it in a good way? Are we doing the right things? Um, and we don't have a choice. We have to work and do the work now. Um, but I think it's good to be kind of reflective on this. So I want to kind of frame it in terms of these two identity crises, and this is a bit, um, you know, simplified, but I think, like, identity is often tied to our relations. People go through identity crisis, you're having an identity of some sort with a group you associate with or your history, you're going through some sort of thing. For the first identity crisis, I want to just kind of frame it in terms of Canada's identity crisis. So Canada as a young country in the early 20th century, there's all these conversations going on about who is Canada. And of course, it's the battle between are we British or are we French? There's a battle over the flag and how we identify ourselves. Um, and it seems like kind of funny for us to think about now, but this actually reached, as many of you probably know, a critical moment in the middle of the 20th century where they actually commissioned Vincent Massey to go out and do a commission to ask who is Canada's identity from a cultural perspective. And so they formed the report, right, 1951. And this started off a Canadian nationalistic journey. Who is Canada as a country? And this led to the Canada Council for the Arts. So this stuff all ties together. This is sort of the Venice Biennale comes out of this, our pavilion in Italy, all comes out of this mandate of defining who is Canada as a culture. And that's Massey and his team there. The other thing about this, which Marco Polo and Colin Ripley did some research on a few years ago now, was there were 900 buildings built in the 1960s following this report. And of course, those buildings ended up sort of defining Canadian architectural identity. Um, and there's just versions of them. They're probably in every city that you've, uh, you've lived in across the country. Um, and so there's this idea of, of a modernism that is distinctly Canadian, or at least that's the, the aspirations. So this kind of plays into what unfolds over the coming decades into this conversation about critical regionalism. Um, and, and most people in the room, I'm assuming, are at least familiar with the idea that Lefebvre and Zonis put forth and then Frampton kind of put it under his arm and ran with, um, and became a major conversation about what is the resistance towards globalizing architecture, the idea that architects can design the same building for any city in any country, and this was obviously not a good thing. And it's been inspirational here in Canada. For instance, Brian McKay Lyons in his book on local architecture said Frampton's critical regionalist thesis has enabled our resistance in the face of numbing cultural influence of globalization. And of course, the Pat Cows and, and Shimon Sutcliffe and many firms have been heralded by Frampton for their work in this area over the years. But the funny thing about Frampton critical regionalist perspective is if you look back before he kind of got into that between 1962 and 65, he was an editor of architectural design. And in those issues, um, as these uh, authors write about that, he was really very interested in what he termed modern architecture in the peripheral situations. Um, and if you think about that, as soon as you label something in the periphery, that means you're, in, you're implying that there's a center, that they're not. But of course, in all those places, there's a center already. So there's already this positioning of architecture as something that moves other places and establishes itself. And he did it through nationalities, for example, which I'll come back to. But his you know, seminal essay that you guys will all be familiar with, and I'll just read the quote that he starts with, which is Paul Ricoeur's 1961 quote. He said, no one can say what will become our civilization when it has met different civilizations by means other than the shock of conquest and domination. But we have to admit that this encounter has not yet taken place at the level of an authentic dialogue. That is why we can no longer practice dogmatism of a single truth and in which we are not yet capable of conquering skepticism into which we have stepped. We are in the tunnel at the twilight of dogmatism and at the dawn of real dialogues. So there's this optimism that critical regionalism is this thing that will create dialogues, primarily with place. Now, the thing about the Massey Commission that I only learned about recently, and maybe some of you already knew this, but I think it has to be pointed out. When it came to Canada's relationship with Indigenous people, heaven forbid that would be talked about in terms of Canada's national identity, this is what the Massey Report reported. 
It is argued that the Indian arts emerged naturally from that combination of religious practices and economic and social customs which constituted the culture of the tribe and the region. The impact of the white man with his more advanced civilization and his infinitely superior techniques resulted in the gradual destruction of the Indian way of life. The Mass Report basically said there was room for Indigenous people in arts and crafts initiatives, maybe in museums. In terms of Canada's identity moving forward, not really a factor. And the REIC gave them their first gold medal, was uh, Vincent Massey, right? So these are some of these truths that we have to kind of come to terms with. So if we go back to critical regionalism and thinking about what does that mean, you know, this author, Keith Egner, talks about the kind of flaws within critical regionalism. And if you kind of pick apart Frampton's uh, heroic descriptions of the critical regionalist architects, it's often very nationalistic. So Andos for Japan, Niemeyer's for Brazil, Korea for India, Barragan for Mexico. Uh, so in other words, this kind of single regionalist style emerges of an architect who's defining it. Um, but the bottom paragraph, he says, we might begin by raising a series of questions that are often asked by scholars of nationalism and post-colonialism. What are the constituents of cultural or regional national identity? How and by whom are the answers to these questions decided? What are the implications of these decisions having been made? So think about kind of the cultural fingerprint that the Massey Commission put on for Canadian architecture and design moving forward. It's significant if you look at the way it unfolded over the years. And I was just recently looking into this and I found this blog, which is, of course, I have no idea who uh, P. Lero 1910 and Non Sequitur are. But this is a very interesting conversation they're having where he's saying or she's saying, I want to know what the names of American or North American architects are considered under critical regionalist architecture. Somebody says, Pat Cow is a decent one for Canadian West Coast region. Following along these lines, I'd add Douglas Cardinal, but only his early works. Douglas Cardinal? How so? French, I mean early cardinal, real early, like back to the days of the design-built churches early, see St. Mary's Church in Red Deer in 1969. The least indigenous maybe outward building that Douglas did, of course, organic architecture is one of his things, but the early work was Grand Prairie College, St. Mary's Cathedral. As his career evolves, he does more and more work with First Nations people where culture starts to get into the picture. But guess what, guess, guess what the, the critical regionalist hated more than modern architecture was postmodern architecture, right? So if something had symbols or meaning in it, it was like, you know, gave them squirmy. They squirmed about it. So I'm, I, I won't go too much deep into that other than to say this question of what is our national identity and what do you present at the Canadian Pavilion is very much a, a question for me. Who are you representing? And I'm right now uh, doing a, my second design studio looking at Canadian embassies abroad. So we, last year we were in Mexico City. And this year, my students are in Washington, and we're looking at, you know, who does Canada represent? And, and for instance, is it trying to represent Indigenous people in its international affairs? How do you represent that? All those questions. But anyways, in all of these readings and thinking about this, I came across um, this realization for me that our parliament building that sits there um, is actually an embassy. And if you think about that, this is unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people. So really, we should be reframing it. This is an embassy for people who associate with a government of people of Canada, but it's totally disconnected to the land of where that building sits. And that will sort of come to the, to the next identity crisis. So the next identity crisis is sort of the one I think we're kind of in together collectively right now, which is a combination of different things, an identity crisis of multiple different people cohabiting the same planet, um, a lot of friction, a lot of tension, a lot of injustice going on, um, a lot of good reason to, put, to raise the flag uh, and stand up for things. Um, and then the second major crisis I, think, I hope we're all having as humans is our relations with our non-human world, with Mother Earth. Um, so we're kind of in, I, I think we're starting to get peppered with a lot of crises these days, everybody. I think often as a teacher, I look at the responsibilities on our students. And when I was in school, you could do like an architecture project and they didn't even care if you had structure in your building as long as it was interesting intellectually and it looked really cool. It was a, a project. And nowadays, our students are being asked to solve climate and social issues and political issues and, and also make it look cool. So there's a lot um, more on their plate. But this has to be one of the central conversations we are responsible for as, as architects. And it implies critical regionalism still. 
So, you know, this came out a few years ago now in 19. Uh, they were looking at who the criti critical regionalist architects were around the world, but these authors on, in Architectural Review were saying, Frampton's theory needs a renewed frame of values in which the ground's topographic and political nature is fully recognized. And I highlight political because topographic recognition is what critical regionalism was really good at. Understanding that there are special attributes to places. Ge geographically, designers need to respond to but maybe kind of skipped around the whole political nature of who's on that land and who has a right to relabel that land from their design perspectives. So as I was teaching this course, I came across this paper in International Studies Quarterly, because I'm studying embassies, and the title just kind of smacked me in the face of like, yeah, in this world where practitioners and everybody is, we've got so much on our minds, how do you filter through what's important, right? What relations matter? at the end of the day. You'll hear relationality used a lot by indigenous people. Often many of us sign our letters. If it's a formal letter, I'll sign all my relations. Well, that doesn't mean just my aunts and uncles and my daughters. It means our non-human relations as well. I mean, we're trying to you know, sign uh, in respect of all of them. But they're the ones that introduced this idea of a critical relationalism. And then as I got reading this essay, I thought, this is like really architectural to me, thinking about critical regionalism. Because think about critical regionalism as, as I read this quote with you. They're saying, previous relational approaches have not sufficiently problematized their epistemological commitments. For instance, how they know which relations matter in any given instance, or alternatively, which knowledge do they rely on when thinking about relations? This is problematic because if we do not become epistemically relational, then we fall into the trap of contextual visions, even if those are relational. Without the specificity of a particular relations and knowledge, we reproduce relations of inequality with the denial of its ramifications on the urban centers of the West as the grounds for racial capitalism. It matters who conceptualizes the reactions we center in our analyses, our worlds, and thus which corners and issues of the world we see and problematize. So for me, this was kind of a finally understanding of critical regionalism is an unfinished agenda. It's an unfinished product project. Um, and this is where we can get help. <laughs> so if we want to get back to the environment, I've, I've used this quote many times for students. I think it's just powerful. This is the former dean of the forestry school at Yale in 2013 saying, I used to think the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation, and we scientists don't know how to do that. And you could easily just cross out scientists and throw architects in there, planners, engineers, mention spiritual and cultural transformation, and everybody just gets uncomfortable in their seats, right? We've been so trained not to talk about that world. Now, if only we were listening a little closer, and it sounds like he was here recently with many of you, 1977, Douglas Cardinal's writing, we have something in our way of life, in our roots, in our heritage that is a knowledge that surpasses that of the majority society. They have lost their affinity with the environment. While we still feel the oneness of all living beings, the oneness of all life, we have a tremendous amount of knowledge to offer mankind. We must teach the industrial societies the meaning of life. So it's kind of sad to me that it took the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to then you know, alter government mandates, to then put hundreds of millions of dollars into capital projects that want indigeneity for architects finally to be like, oh yeah, maybe we should start thinking about indigenous issues in our projects now. You know? uh, we kind of missed the boat when, when the word was being spread originally. So what does that mean? Um, this is a teaching that many indigenous people use. It's also used in other contexts, but I'll just throw it up briefly. It's a very simple idea. Um, the indigenous cultural iceberg means that what you see above the water is what you, as non-indigenous people, or myself with another indigenous group, know of that culture. It means that how they look, maybe, their physical looks, how they dress, their regalia, all their different kind of um, identity, all, all their identifiers. But the big teaching is that underneath the water is the epistemology. It's the knowledge system. It's the belief system, it's the spirituality, it's the language, it's how it all ties together. And at the bottom of it is the relation with the national, natural world. I Meaning the epistemology is deeply tied to place. Now, I was in Washington again with my students for this embassy project and I took this picture because this is the tip of an iceberg. 
I don't know if anybody's been to the Library of Congress in Washington. It's a spectacular Beaux Arts building, right? This, uh, and you go up and you read about it. And it's got every single carved puti or, or angel has some symbol in their hand. You've got, you know, every author from history, from Homer to uh, William Scott. Um, so it's like you're reading Western knowledge in the building. The building is expressing a knowledge system, and it kind of begs you to say, I want to learn more. In order to understand this building, I have to know this whole system. Of course, Jefferson's library at the time was myth myth mythically uh, had every bit of knowledge within it. So there's this symbolism of truth and knowledge, but, but this is also an iceberg. This is a teaching lodge at Batchelwana First Nation, an Ojibwe community in the north where I was teaching uh, when I was up at Laurentian University. So just because it's not as extravagant and there's no kind of statues and things, it is rich with oral traditions. There's just as big of an underside of this iceberg as there was with the Western one from the Library of Congress, but it's one that we've kind of failed to understand. For instance, in Washington, how many people know that that's Piscataway territory? Right? When we were there with our students, one of the first things they had to do was understand who the Piscataway people are, why Washington thinks they can claim that territory as, 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 a, as a national capital for whatever their country is. And this is alienation. This is a, a, a slide that I stole from Ram Kulhas. I don't think he's, he'd be too offended. Um, because he was critiquing himself and the work of a lot of architects around the world in this ecological conference many years ago. And what I love about it is this kind of powerful representation of the total disconnect between the land and the architecture that we're putting onto it, right? There is no relationship. And this is also alienation. So this is indigenous architecture according to Mid Journey. Um, and so I did this as an experiment a few years ago. This is just a modern design campus building expressing, this is Cree at uh, 506. At uh, 508, I did some Maori buildings, uh, Australian Aboriginal at 509, and then I got tired and, and gave up with Inuit at uh, 511. So in about six minutes, I'd done, uh, what is that, 16 different indigenous buildings. So what does this tell us? What is AI telling us about indigenous design moving forward? That if we focus so much on the visuality of indigenizing our cities, right, Every, if we, even if we redid every library and building in downtown Toronto to look more Haudenosaunee or more Anishinaabe, what are we doing about the, the relations that really matter, the teachings that hold up those images? That's what indigeneity is about. It's, it's really not, it is about the visuality, but it's not all of it. So this question of like, what are the real dialogues that Recur was actually putting forth that Frampton somehow, especially in his early mind, just totally ignored the fact that there were already um, embedded knowledge systems, epistemologies of place all over the world that modern architecture didn't actually and couldn't uh, adjust to. So I'm going to jump into housing now a little bit and thinking about what is this, what is critical relationalism? And this is a really kind of silly um, example, but um, when my daughters were much younger, they were like three and five and they loved seeing these on TV when we were up in Sudbury. And uh, we don't, there's no, um, um, Venus flytraps in Sudbury, so I had to get one shipped out from Vancouver, and I very happily planted it in our garden for my daughters, and the next day they were like yellow and like dying. So it took my, my wife to come out, and she's like, what are you doing? Like, that soil is way too wet for these things, right? So she replanted it in this kind of sand mixture that she found and put it back in the sun, and of course it thrived. Well, the point was obviously that every living organism has a very specific set of conditions around it that allows it to thrive. This is what Alexander said about housing. He said that all in all, there's a colossal mismatch between the organization of decision and control and the needs of appropriateness and good adaptation, which the biological reality of the housing system actually requires. If you think about houses as living organisms, buildings as or living organisms, what do they require? Well, this is the suburban house that we're all very familiar with. And what does it need to survive? Well, the first thing it needs is a road system, so you can drive to and from work to, so that you can pay for your house. Uh, you need a car, um, you need a sewer system, you need a clean water line, you need somebody that can maybe repair your roof, uh, somebody can fix your furnace when it gets cold out. Um, all of these things. Most importantly, what do you need? You need a bank who's going to give you the money for it so you can get into a mortgage situation and pay it off so you can actually own it 
and then sell it and then move up the ladder. This is what my parents did, many of your parents did for many generations. It's the number one wealth generator in all of Canada. Um, the image on the right sort of is the ultimate commodity of it, right? This is one of the Sears homes uh, from the early uh, 20th century. And if you notice down at the bottom, it says, A, don't build the building. It says, don't, don't attempt to build this building. So the first message is nobody should build. And the second one is don't hire an architect for $100. So it means don't hire someone to design a house for you because we got you figured out. It's a commodity you can buy. We've got it at the product you need uh, and it'll thrive. But what happens when you let that go uh, sort of unfettered is you end up with things like this. This is, I don't, I hope none of you bought this house a few years ago, but um, I don't know. I mean, I'm from Northern Saskatchewan. That doesn't look like a $2.7 million house to me. What is happening? with the relationship between the cost of housing and this idea of home. And then the worst thing is, what the government did is they picked up that house, ripped it out of its whole root systems, and then replanted it on these reserves uh, all throughout Canada and said, good luck with that. There's no mortgage. There's no ownership model for that house. Sometimes there's not even clean water. There's sometimes not sewer systems. There's bathrooms that were put in houses and reserves in the far north with no running water. So they repurposed their, their bathtubs into storage units and other things because a house is a house, right? So it, it died. And then everybody drives by and say, oh, those lazy Indians, why can't they take care of their houses? Jeez, you know, like uh, there's a systemic re re relationship here between housing. So this is imposed alienation. This is someone else alienating you from the lands that you know familiar, that you are familiar with. And it goes much into more depth in, in terms of housing alienation for me. You know, we, we talked with Maria Campbell. Some of you may know her. She wrote Half-Breed, uh, Métis Elder, um, about this. And she said, well, I'm not an architect. I don't know anything about this. And then she started talking about the one-room house and how the grandmothers in these houses used to sleep right here. This is the grandmother. And so if guys came in after drinking a little bit too much or a little bit rowdy, the grandmothers would be like, nope, you're not coming in the house. And they would protect the women and the children in these houses, she said. And then it sort of dawned on her as we got talking that once the INAC houses started coming into play, that there were private rooms and grandma could kind of quietly go into a room and nobody was there to check the door and some bad things started happening with alcoholism, people. Privatization, it's something we just think is so normal. It's not normal. No indigenous community around the world had privatized rooms to protect their children. So, you know, I'm guilty as charged as well. That we start our children from this premise of let them cry it out in their cribs, give them their own room, you know, you, as you get older, you compete in sports to get better. Then the next decision is you get good grades so you can go to the best university. And then you choose the university. And then you get the best grades in university to get the best job. And then you go to the city that pays you most. And where are your family relations in all that decision making in our system? For First Nations peoples, all decision making is for the better of your kin, your relations. You stay with your family. You protect your land, the animals. You have a responsibility for that. Our system is... We're brought up to think about ourselves and how we get to the finish line with the most stuff we can. So this is what leads, this is where the two worlds collide into what we, I'm passionately against is, is housing alienation. So that's the team, uh, for those of you that um, may have read about us before, um, Architects Against Housing Alienation, just an amazing group of inspiring people. Um, I won't name them one by one. But the Venice Beyond Alley project that was uh, put forth, uh, two of us being indigenous, Patrick Stewart is a Niska architect. Um, and we really wanted this to be a grassroots architectural activism without re any of us really knowing what that meant. We just knew that we didn't want to go to Venice and do an art project. We wanted to do something that sort of raised the fist with the problem that we're dealing with uh, here in Canada. And um, so what we did is we reached out to uh, a number of groups, and this is where the, the team really expanded. We decided that we wanted it to be kind of um, comprehensive. So there are 10 teams listed in the middle, and each team is made of an architect, an activist, and an advocate. We didn't think that for housing, the appropriate thing was for a bunch of architects to go over to Venice and project as if we knew what the housing solutions were. We know that there's people on the ground working with communities all over the country. They're working hard, and some of them need support. 
and they don't have the money to uh, hire an architect, and yet we know a lot of architects are passionately interested in this as well. So it was kind of like a matchmaking game for the first half of the project is to say, let's put together these little teams across the country and see what, what would you demand to make housing better? What is your demand as a group? And the activists led that. And so this is from our website where you can see them. I'm just gonna name them very briefly. The first one that came out of the conversations was a sim very simple demand of land back. So that's led by Patrick Stewart on the West Coast and a question of what does that mean for cities across the country, um, for provinces, for the federal government, and how do you deal with that? The next one is on the land housing, which is um, focused on particularly indigenous women in Canada who are disproportionately pushed out of housing for many different reasons and how they can learn to be at home again back on land. Um, the, next, the, the third one is the one I'll talk about in a second. Um, reparative architecture talks about black communities in Toronto here who basically through gentrification uh, are destroying the cultural fabric of their communities. Uh, a gentrification tax is a very interesting proposal uh, by another Torontonian team that says if your property gains value because they put a new, uh, let's say a new subway station, that just, you just won the jackpot, right? Your property just doubled. Well, why should you, out of everybody just out of luck, get all of that money for yourself? So it is you, you tax the, the, um, the money that you make on top of your, of, your, of your house. And that money then, the key here is that goes folded into affordable housing in the neighborhood, which prevents neighborhoods from becoming all $2.7 million houses, allows for diversity and inclusion within neighborhoods. Uh, surplus properties for housing is a simple idea if, muni if municipal governments have leftover land that they're not using for 20 or 30 years and you'd be surprised how many of those properties there are, they should have a responsibility to turn that into affordable housing for people. Um, intentional communities are the small, house, uh, small homes uh, that you'll see around. Um, this is also a Toronto group and they are making some really good progress right now. Collective ownership is about sort of again co-op models of housing, particularly for cultural groups in Canada. This one is on the west coast in Vancouver. Mutual aid housing asks the question of how can we provide social housing that has all the amenities to avoid the kind of uh, prude eagle failure of, of social housing, but actually think more about people's lives and what they need within them. And then ambient e ecosystems commons asks the question of why do we keep talking about housing as individual thing when it's actually part of a water system, it's part of a much bigger, much more complex network and how do you think about housing in sort of in a way that benefits the whole ecosystem? And a big part of it, hopefully some of you are on our campaign. If you aren't yet, please join if you're, if you're social media people. The six of us found out very early on that we needed to get in social media and none of us were very good at it, so we had to get some help. Um, but we're on Instagram. Um, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, this is the pavilion as it opened up. So this is the, the design included Basically wrapping Canada's pavilion in a tent city from Vancouver, make a statement to the world that Canada is not kind of the land of, uh, uh, of uh, fortune that you can all immigrate to and, and have a great life, that we actually are in a very serious problem here. That was the opening with uh, my colleagues. And just very quickly, these are just some images from the inside where we created a mezzanine for students to work above. And basically they are campaign workers. They have been campaign workers. Um, this is the land back garden. So the first demand was located in the garden space to talk about land and have uh, discussions about what that means. And then inside each of the demands has its own kind of uh, space to be set up. Um, there's the students at work. So I'm gonna just focus in on, on ours to go back to the previous questions about indigenous housing. So First Nations home building lodges and it just gives you sort of a dive in and I would just like to emphasize that this is just one of the 10 all 10 of these demands are still alive and well and moving forward in similar ways. So I just wanted to share this with you. So it, you get a sense of how AHA is uh, a much bigger collaborative. It's a movement, we hope. Um, and this is the, at the center of our team is One House, Many Nations, which is a branch of Idle No More, which many of you will know from, uh, from a few years ago. Um, and they have this idea of what they call a universal utility core. I'm not gonna get into any detail, but the basic concept is to take the mechanical systems outside of the house so they can be serviced properly and replaced um, because a lot of the issues in remote northern communities in Manitoba and throughout Canada is that mechanical systems don't function properly or people shut them off because they can't afford their diesel bills. Uh, and then you've got a plastic wrapped house with a lot of moisture inside and then mold problems come in. So the idea here was to kind of look, what is the, these are all versions that were done by Jacob Manns on what that would mean 
And then our task a few years ago now was to say, okay, we actually need to build one of these. Like, we can't just diagram all of this out. So we looked at a bunch of varieties of this. And then when we saw our budget, <laughs> we realized that we were going to do a very simple shed house. But this is just to give you a sense of what a universal utility core means. It means that somebody can come to the back here and service this thing, and the family doesn't have to get disturbed. So we built two prototypes for this, um, just showing what that means. So the kitchen's on the other side here. Uh, the bathroom is in here, and, and really there, there's some ducting. We've had versions where it just throws the heat, but um, in, in essence, the, this is all so it can be serviced. This is the rendering. They actually just got finished construction this week, but we don't have very good photos of them. Um, but this is the idea that uh, we put together for that, including, and this is the core. I know it's not a very exciting slide, but the biggest factor of this was they would be made on community. So one of the biggest problems, I'll get to in a second, is the idea of First Nations being consumers. But how can consumers become producers of housing? And this is really inspired by Alex Wilson. And, uh, you know, I, I'm so inspired by her that it's, I, I called this whole project Housing as Cosmology because she's the only person in the world that I've ever seen give a talk on housing and she started with the constellations and talked about the constellations relationship to the forest and the animals and then how the wood becomes an important part of their responsibility for housing and other things and it's all interrelated. Uh, she's really an incredible speaker. And she helped me rework my diagram. I had done this diagram years ago and then she looked at it and said, yeah, you know, you got a tall, kind of fit man and a smaller woman, and they have like two children, and she's like, you're just recreating the paternal uh, the vision of the suburban home. And I thought, yeah, she's right. So we, t we retweaked it. Um, and for me, is, is key is the figure here who's actually building the house. So this was the exhibit. This just featured um, some of the projects that, uh, that they're doing. I just want to point out briefly, too, we had a great group of people, uh, beaters, so the constellation is beaded into this fabric, as is the fire. So we brought in traditional ways of beading into the graphic and, and also looked at traditional ways of um, using the twine to attach it. We didn't want to just do a poster for Venice. We felt like that was antithetical to what we were saying, that this needed to be something special. Um, and then we just kind of looked at this idea, like what is housing as commodity? Well, it starts with this idea of property, like a site, and then you need a bank and then you have mortgages, and then there's money flying all over the place. And this is kind of how housing as commodity works, and it kind of leads to the same predictable patterns that we all know. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's predictable, um, it's hard to uh, navigate, um, and on reserves, it functions like this. So I don't know how many of you know how housing on reserves work, but basically, the federal government, who has a treaty relationship to provide housing, as part of the fact that everyone else is benefiting off of the resources from their lands, um, money ends up going to like who makes the windows and the doors and th because you need stamped lumber, uh, you can't actually use the wood from your own community. I don't know if people realize that. So those uh, companies end up making money and then uh, there's manufacturing for shingles and then usually it's built by non-indigenous people. So at the end of the day, the money's pretty much gone by the time the house is built and then the indigenous community gets the, the home, which is great. Um, but that's kind of missing the point in terms of capacity building. So instead we say housing is not a commodity. This is a cosmology and you put home at the center and land is not property. Land is about your animals and your water and your territories. Um, the language is what weaves this all together, which Alex talks about. And our, my good friend James here is very much investigating that language is actually, when you think about that, that iceberg, it's the key. The key, access to the underside has to be language, which again, who knows that. But this is how we're trying to disrupt that circle, is actually give the money directly to a home building lodge where design will happen with elders and knowledge carriers. People can teach the youth about what it means to build in their community, what values does their community have. And then when they need things, they'll bring in the windows and doors and the high efficiency HRV units from wherever they come from. But to put as much money into the community and build their capacity, why can't they be providers and not always on the short end of being a, a, a consumer? And then looking at it as part of what does it mean within the community? So within OCN, how does it become a center of learning? So building and housing becomes part of a cultural narrative. How do we produce construction documents in 20 years that are in Cree, right? How, how, do, how can we have Cree construction documents with elders teaching traditional ways of doing it, uh, as well as a manufacturing facility? 
And you know, I just, I, this is from this afternoon. I threw this in there very last second. But I just wanted to share that the evolving campaign, and so students are still working at it, and now architectural activism is folding itself into the activists. So we see gaps. We, we, well, we didn't see gaps. One House Many Nations came to us and said, you know, our, our social media page is kind of, we're not sure where it's going, and it's been kind of quiet. And so they asked the students to start to vision what would a social media campaign look for that is from architects who can draw, who can communicate buildings, who can communicate in a certain way. Um, so now the campaign is really supporting One House Many Nations. I met with the chief of Opaswe Cree Nation last week with Alex, and uh, she's really excited. And so this is, you know, compared to some Biennale projects where you get done, you get a book, uh, pat yourself on the back. Um, that was never our vision of this, that this is going to go on for years. And so we are not going to be totally happy until there's a building launch at Opaswe Cree Nation. It could be five years now. Um, and the social media continues as well. And just to show how the students are now, they uh, aligned with uh, a housing group, an activist group in Venice, um, and they were out on the streets in Venice uh, helping protest. Um, so there's this idea that architects can inject themselves and be part of a meaningful contribution to housing justice around the world. Um, and I'm gonna stop there. I well, you know what? Am I good for four more minutes? This is gonna be the part of the talk that everyone's gonna be like, why did he throw all those slides in at the end? But uh, I just wanted to share that, you know, a lot of the talks, so that's kind of like my academic hat on, but in the side, I am doing a lot of work in practice, and these are just mainly renderings of, of different projects, but just to show that the challenge, I, I kind of don't want to underplay how hard it is to do this in urban settings, um, given the kind of colonial infrastructures of production, uh, which are very, very hard. So I'm just going to show some examples of some small work that my firm has done. This is a little cabin at Lac de Mills, Lake, Lac First Nation. What, this was the first project we were commissioned to do for a, for a family, um, and it never got built. Um, but it sort of set us going on a certain path of responding to certain needs, uh, specific domestic needs of indigenous peoples. This was um, an elder's lodge that was finished a few years ago. Um, everything in here I won't get into is informed by Métis traditional building and cultural practices. Um, there's representations of the sash. Um, and we really, we moved a parking lot out of the way so elders could have a garden, uh, which has been very well received. Um, and you can see on our sunshades on the south side, Métis people, we are known as the flower beadwork people. So we kept saying, why did they have to be so nondescript? Let's put our beadwork in there. And there's this amazing thing happens when the sun comes through and you see the flower on, on, the, on the building behind. It's quite beautiful. Um, this is one that just finished in Regina last month, actually. People are moving in right now. Again, I, I have to emphasize the budgets on these. These are all modular builds. Um, they're almost like zero budget. So you, you, and, and on this one, they said, we, we can only afford to make the roof that shape. So I said, OK. Um, but you know, how do you do this in a way? This, this shade uh, design was done by a Cree artist, um, which has a lot of symbolic meaning about the home fire meaning to their community li related to the teepee. And uh, the posts along the front, so I've been very lucky to um, learn some teepee teachings from various people. So there's 15 posts there. So that idea that the teepee, the symbology of the teepee is there wrapping the corner, it's wrapping the building, reminding it of its cultural roots. Um, this is one I just want to share very briefly. Um, this is a project in, in Kamloops that uh, should be started soon. Um, and it's also for Métis housing, social housing, very low budget, um, a cultural center on the main floor, and a daycare on the second floor. So that's why you see that outdoor space. But I wanted to share something that I think so a lot of things that I'm questioning myself to this, like, you know, who am I as a Métis architect? How do I possibly do this critical relationalism in these you know, um, impossible circumstances, and it's really comes down to process for me. So I, I'm sure many of you are aware of Métis beadwork, um, but this is something that a lot of people don't know unless you're a Métis person, uh, that this little blue bead in there, people would think that's just a mistake. And that's actually called a spirit bead, um, and that's my alarm. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, but a spirit bead is, is there intentionally. And it's to remind the world that there's beauty and imperfections. It's also a message of humility, to remind yourself that you, can't, you don't have to be perfect all the time. Um, and, and it also can be a signature piece that somebody can kind of say, if you see the right beadwork, you might say, oh, I, I think I know who did that. Um, there's many other teachings in this. But um, so something that I've explored this, because this is a pure Métis building done with an incredible Métis group in Kamloops, was you know, what would a spirit panel be? What could an architect do? And so we've been talking about 
putting a, the odd thing that'll look like a mistake on the building, but we'll have a ceremony with that panel. We'll have community members come together with that panel. And for those people that know and were part of that ceremony, that will become part of the story of the, that building, as well as all the other cultural references. Um, and then we're working on another concept in Saskatchewan. And this one, again, is going back to teepee, but questioning, you know, how do you do affordable housing, modular build, like you're basically decorating a box. Um, but how do you decorate it in a way that might mean something for Cree people that connects to their traditions and, and their architecture? So these are all things that I'm working on in every project. We're still coming back to this question now of like, what relations mean the most and how can that help ground us and how does that help us fight this beast of alienation that um, many of us are facing. So thank you, Marcy. We have time to sit down? Yes, I think so. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that talk. You, uh, covered, you covered a wide range of issues, from the challenges of the designs that you showed at the end to uh, strategies for thinking about uh, access to land and housing that include, I think, you know, like tax policy, um, land policy, uh, things of that sort, and also so, some issues that revolve around, for instance, um, you know, just for instance, the, 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 the unit that permits uh, a serviceable mechanical system. So it's, it, there are a lot of, a lot of things. Um, I was struck by the challenge that the, um, the sort of cautionary tale that your AI images <laughs> raised, and I, and I, at the like uh, they made me think a, a bit about the um, you know the challenges that you faced uh, as an architect and designer in the last several slides that you that you showed thinking about how um, you know particularly within the urban setting and within the economies that those settings often have particularly for let's say affordable forms of housing uh, where the um, you know where are the innovations where is this where does the uh, deeper signifying aspects of the architecture reside because I, I in some ways thought in the in some of the last images that made me think a bit about the more serious uh, moments of housing in in modernist architectural history like Bruno Tout where uh, housing complexes were situated around um, gardens uh, at scales that were uh, say humane and that, that um, uh, you know that operated with some I mean even though they often uh, in, in terms of images and particularly early ones look very uh, modernist and alienating they're actually finely grained institution uh, housing institutions so um, I'm just wondering if what your reflections are on um, on those challenges that have to do with the with the with let's let's say the the rigors and demands of the economies of contemporary building uh, in the city and the and the goals that you've set uh, set out for us today in terms of responding to the particularities of ways of living wa ways of knowing yeah. uh, ways of discovering meaning in buildings. I mean, I think I don't know. Am I still on? Yeah. Um, it's very challenging. I think my answer is patience. I mean, in a one in a one word, because um, the knowledge it can't come in in in. No one can absorb the knowledge very quickly. Let's say on a project to project basis, and because the infrastructure is already so restrictive mm -hmm. that it just it's not going to be able to change overnight. But a couple of examples come to my mind that I'll share with you. First one was from an architect telling me that she was working with a. Um, on a hospital project and they brought in a, an elder and uh, they presented the whole project and uh, she sat there for a while and she was super quiet and then first question she said is like, can you tell me where the, where, if, I'm assuming people die in this hospital mm -hmm. and everyone on the table is kind of like, oh, okay, <laughs> didn't think we were going to go there, but yeah, people die here and she said, where do the bodies come out of this hospital? And they said, oh, I don't know. So they started shuffling through their papers and went to the basement plans. They're like, well, I guess it comes out this elevator and then we roll it down and it goes out here. 
And the elder just shook her head and she's like, you can't do that. That's disrespecting the body. It's going the wrong direction. You should be going out this direction. And the whole team just kind of froze. I thought, oh my God, we thought that, that like who would have thought that that was an important factor? Um, you know, and another example was, uh, and it's not related to housing, um, but um, we worked on the indigenous people space with Wanda Della Costa and Aladia Smoke and I, and that one, there were so many lessons because it was, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that project, but we, we, were, we were commissioned to give an indigenous version of what to do with the uh, indigenous people space with former American embassy. Well, we started doing some drawings about recapturing the land beside the building for land-based, like a fire space or land-based learnings. And that caught the attention of the Block 2 competition group because that's slated to be an office building. So they called a meeting with us and they said, well, really like your work, but um, you, you can't actually do that there because that's part of our project. <laughs> and then they said, you know, you guys, these are property lines and you know what, architects have to respect property lines. Well, that really rubbed us wrong because we were kind of thinking to ourselves, A, we knew it wasn't gonna get built in the first place, but it's like, we're sitting, this will be the most important indigenous building in Canadian history, I, I, you know, I, iconically. And you're telling us we can't cross a property line on unsurrendered, unceded Algonquin territory? Like, this is so, our elder on the project said to us, Winnie Pitawanaquit, she just said, you know, just design something that your grandmothers will be proud of at the end of the day. And so we just, screw, we said, screw it. We're <laughs> throughout the property line and we just went for it. Um, and so like out of, out of that, there were more than that. There was more to that story. But I did want to share that we were kind of showing renderings to Winnie one day and um, she was very quiet like the elders often are, especially when architects are talking about form making and things. And she said, yeah, yeah, it's nice. And then she <laughs> said, uh, I think there needs to be a soup kitchen here. Mm. And, and again, we were all just like, what? We weren't even talking, like we were talking about a whole bunch of other things. She said, yeah, like, look at the building across the street, look how exclusive that is. And she goes, where do people come for food who are hurting in this city? And I, I want them to come to the indigenous people space. They should come here and know that they always can come here. And it was one of those things again, like, oh, wow, it kind of jars people in these urban conversations of like, again, we get so wrapped up in property lines and and where we need to build and what it should look like. And at the end of the day, she's saying, what are the values? Again, this question of what, what are the relations? What are you actually doing here that makes a difference? So I think like in, in, in the projects that we're working on in all these cases, it's, there are little moves in each one of those that I, you know, I could pick apart and they're not like, you know, I'm not gonna make Scarpa fans proud, you know, the detailing on a, on a kind of modular box is, challenging, but to the people that are in there, where we put place for a sacred fire, where are we addressing the, uh, the directions so somebody can know which direction they're facing inside the building? The signage, we put um, little things like, on our projects, we always put the language. A little thing you can do in urban environments is acknowledge the language uh, of the place. So uh, somebody walks in and says, oh, somebody actually knows that this language belongs here. Um, you know, so it's, it's a lot of little things. And then my thinking is that it's going to take generations, you know, like if you look at, I think probably to when we were in school compared to the education that our students are getting, by the time they become urban planners and architects, they're much more attuned, I think, to making better decisions that might help right the ship. So, yeah, I think my answer is uh, I str we struggle with it every day and I think it's a patience game. Great. That's I mean, I, I, I think in some ways, uh, I mean, there obviously there are many different registers and some of the things you're describing are often invisible with regard to what we often have thought of as important issues in architecture or you were describing at the very beginning of your lecture, you know, making cool objects. Yeah. But often it's uh, subtleties of plan and program arrangement that provide uh, structures of social life, which um, they don't change the apparent physiognomy of a building, but they do, they do substantiate uh, ways of being. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've had this, so Greg Schofield is the guy that wrote that book on the beadwork and, and Métis beadworkers, they talk about, I've had this conversation with him about buildings and beadwork because he will tell you that uh, you could get a machine to master beadwork and throw in some Christie Belcourt paintings and hammer out some beadwork things overnight, no problem. Mm. They will not carry the stories that they, when the aunties bead, beaded, when they bead, they usually bead in groups and you tell stories and you, you do teachings over beadings and that's embedded in the object. 
So it's more like, for me, when we're working on projects, it's like the same thing. Like, what are we sharing as a group? How many meals do we share together? And, and, and you know, the idea of the spirit panel is like, at the end of the day, yeah, anybody could design that building that would look like that. If they took our cues or whatever, punched in, in, in a few years, Métis contemporary architecture, they might come up with that. But are they able to orchestrate a meaningful process whereby the people feel it? That you feel different in these buildings, like the beadwork, it's, it's a different thing. So maybe um, I'll, be my, I'll make it my last question and turn it out to the audience, but along those lines, I think, uh, in, in some ways, the AI images uh, bring to mind a kind of uh, prejudice that I think architects still are heirs to, which is toward the um, you know postmodern architecture, even though it had its uh, momentary day, perhaps for a decade and a half or two. Uh, but this uh, the, the suspicion that somehow decoration is a superficial reference to, I, I suppose, insubstantial culture or signals, but what you're describing is another way to come at um, this like, sort of semiotic or symbolic aspect of the building, which is that it is the product of more embedded traditions or practices or elaborations. Anyway, maybe it's more just a comment that I am noticing that there's a way to think about the discourse of what we, of the symbolic and the ways in, and, and even with the cautionary remark that you quoted at the beginning of yep. your lecture about commodifying, you know, sort of decorative patterns, skirts, yep. and yep. Uh, you know, ceramics and things of this sort, there there may be times when materials that look like commodities may, in fact, actually be the product of a very different set of processes and involvements of uh, the people for whom the building is dedicated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There is meaning, and it means a lot to people. And Patrick Stewart is one for sure that will talk about that. Like, that idea of re-establishing those signs is an important part of reconciliation because they were stolen, they were outlawed, and they meant things to people. So mm -hmm. seeing them again is very important. It's very empowering. It's recognition. So, but yeah, it's a slippery line on the commodification, right? And, yeah. uh, and the visualization of it and the cultural appropriation and everything else that can come along with it. So. Interesting. Okay, I will uh, turn it to the audience if people have questions. It's hard for me to see. Oh, there's yeah. one. And there's a microphone coming to you. So uh, you touched upon like one part of it. Uh, am I screaming here? Uh, there was like one slide with the climate change issues, economics, all those things. And just ending it with your like a final slide that what relations. I guess when you are working on your project and you show some of the housing project towards the end, and I'm wondering how much of those other sort of so-called bigger issues that we, we as architects we all know really go into working, like being part of your sort of ideas that you consider for your projects. And, and does that happen? As an architect, I mean, you know, I, I most of the times, you know, engineers, con uh, you know, clients, we, we talk about budgets and timelines and things like property lines. And how, I guess I'm just wondering what really gets decided, who gets, who gets to make that, those decisions? Yeah. How much of it? Yeah, I think in a lot of those projects when we're working with communities, who makes the decisions? As many as we can, we, we let the, the community lead those decisions. Now, not actually like, you know, where does a window go in and those sorts of things. But one of the things that I would say, so for instance, we've worked with a community, Whitefish Lake First Nation in Alberta, and, um, you know, we, I was getting excited about uh, TP teachings and how we could... And they right away, they just cut us off and they're like, we're not interested in that. Like, that's not us. We want to, we want to be progressive. We want these to be as built as quick as we can. That's our number one thing. We want them to be energy efficient and we want to see how we can like market them. And that was kind of it. So we ended up doing SIP panels because that's all we could afford. And they led the conversation. And in the end, they, <laughs> they took our renderings and put their own siding on it and changed the interior and everything. So it's like one of those things that will probably never show up on our website. But on, a, on another level, I, was, I mean, everybody's quite happy because that was their first housing project they'd undertaken in quite a few years. And they're very happy and proud about it uh, that they really took it on. 
So I think like um, first thing is the community leads a, a that discussion. Um, and then there's obviously engagement um, where you're listening um, and who, you know, most projects nowadays, there are cultural people brought on through the community. You get the right people at the table um, and you keep on meeting and listening to those people. Um, and then as an architect, like the things that we bring to the table that the community sometimes does, but usually is less uh, engaged in are the sustainability item, items. So like, you know, we always first foremost look at where the sun is. So the sun shades become a very important device for us to say, you should know which side of the building you're on. You know, there's n the four sides of our buildings never look the same. Um, especially in, in colder climates, putting shades around northern windows is a disservice because you need more light and all those simple things that all architects are dealing with. Um, and then every one of those projects are net zero ready as well. So, you know, even like on, on the white buildings, you'll see we used EFIS on that, which is not like my number one choice. Like I wouldn't choose that if I had the options of the world, but then we do all our energy modeling and we say, okay, we can get it to net zero if we use this under this budget and somebody's gonna get a house for $400 a month. That's the first, the elders lodge in Saskatoon. That's what people are paying there, $450 a month for a rent. Um, so like there's always this balancing act of like, I would love to do this, but no. And then we propose real wood on the building and the community says, we don't want real wood because uh, it's just gonna degrade and we don't wanna deal with the, so like it's not all the architect we're listening all the time and saying, okay, we'll, we'll respond to your maintenance team. So, but I mean, for me, it's environment and then cultural relevance and, and making sure that people walk in and say it means something to them. On, Yeah, I think so. I mean, to your point, one of the, so on the Elders Lodge, one of my favorite moments of my entire career was uh, for, the, for the opening, the main woman who said she dreamt about this building for 30 years, like she's been working so hard for, to get these elders because a lot of them were sleeping in cars, a lot of them were homeless, uh, and she got this building built and she took our rendering and made a t-shirt of it. Uh, and at all the events, she kept showing up with our rendering on her. And I thought, like, as an academic, I'm like, that's peer review for me. Like, I, can, I don't care if it wins a Canadian Architect Award ever. But the fact that she actually embodied the building and felt like it represented the culture and, and her agenda, that's, the, that's very heartwarming. Yeah. Um, Professor Sultan? Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a very practical question, and I'll explain why. The practical question is to know which buildings you think should have vapor barriers and which ones that's actually really unhelpful. But the reason I ask is a couple of years ago at Daniels, our Masters of Visual Studies students invited the Anishinaabe artist Caroline Manet to exhibit mm -hmm. this beautiful series of screen prints made on Tyvek vapor right. barriers. And I mean, they're, they're so stunning, but they're not only beautiful pieces of art, but they're the most powerful critique of architecture that I, that I can think of. But I also want to know, you know, because we just learn, you know, you draw the vapor barrier and it, it has to yeah. go here. And maybe you could just re-educate me for a couple of minutes about why it's really bad, actually, in a lot of contexts. Well, you know, it's good and bad. I think it's, it serves its purpose in a lot of different residential architecture, similar to that house with all its rooted system that thrives. If we equate that to kind of suburban Toronto, the vapor barrier plays a very important role. Um, I mean, it's been sort of a conversation for me for a decade now because, um, you know, as I was studying Métis building techniques, Métis people for generations, well, many, many settlers as well, built with log construction, right? You have a, you have a wood stove in your, in your house, you have a log, it breathes, you, you plaster it and lime it. Um, and then you relime it and, the, and, and everything works perfectly because it's in tune with each other. Um, and then when, uh, the, for instance, in Alberta, the Métis people were given settlements, which are kind of like reserves. Um, but in order to get houses built on the reserve, of course, uh, the government came by and said, well, you can't build that, that's, a, that's terrible technology. We've got much better systems for you, which were under, in, uns, under insulated two by four thin walls that ended up falling apart. Um, but of course, those were the superior models and they weren't able to build uh, like that again. 
Um, and so we've had investigations, for instance, on a Métis, another, well, one of the Métis settlements about a no vapor barrier breathable wall system using different kind of wood fiber insulations. Um, and it all makes a ton of sense to do. Um, of course, we went and got that priced. And you're talking about rural Alberta and people looking at the drawings are saying, what's wrong with you guys? Like, that's not how you build. And then we get it and it ended up being like 800 bucks a square foot and the community just couldn't, could, there's no capacity for that stuff. So indigenous, non-indigenous, it doesn't matter. There are some really great knowledge carriers uh, in, in the prairies who know how to build these houses, but actually to get people there that can build it and do it in a way that doesn't feel like communities are getting a cheaper version of an experiment to move into. Like there's the psychology of the inhabitant that's at play too in a lot of these. They wanna feel like they're in a nice contemporary home. So there's so many barriers to that question. I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, the vapor barrier should not be considered the, the all solution. And even when we have proposed it in some communities, some people will just say, well, we don't, we don't wanna have to chop wood all winter and we don't wanna have to, like, because the relationship, that's what's beautiful about the, the symb symbiotic relationship between the wood stove and the building envelope, because they both need each other to breathe and, and they just work in synergy, you know, so. It was always ironic to me, like we went to one of my dad's friends in Lac La Biche and a non-Indigenous guy who's had a really good career and he's got this huge cabin on the lake, literally like 30 kilometers from the, from the settlement where everyone was told not, they couldn't have log cabins. And of course, here's this massive, beautiful log cabin with a stone fireplace in the middle and this guy's enjoying his, his drink looking at the lake. So it's, yeah, it, that whole building system thing has been a problem. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I, I have a mic. Um, thank you so much for, for that lecture, which put so much out um, in front of us to, to, to think about. Um, I, I, my question is really um, about uh, the, the use of the term alienation and some of, some of the other things that you were talking about. It seems to me you, you um, were really uh, launching a very um, uh, robust critique of capitalism itself, and yet that word, I think, was not mentioned one time in your lecture, right. and I'm really curious about that. Um, um, I, I assume it's a purposeful elision that you that this is a word that it's become so controversial that it's very difficult to use it without immediately um, falling into a certain kind of ideological trap, maybe. But I just thought I would ask whether you had some comment about about that because it seems as though it is so many of so many parts of your critique are circling around that at that very core issue yeah well thank you for pointing out that i didn't say it that might be the first i don't it wasn't that intentional tonight but um i think embedded in in my position on capitalism goes back to when i was talking about the private room and the child growing up and the sets of decisions that are making it's it's sort of uh, that level of systemic behavior and psychology that is the, the white elephant in the room that is the cause of really all of this. Um, and yet, I think maybe why I'm a little bit hesitant to talk about it, I mean, AHA was very much about like decommodify housing at the end of the day, like enough, right? And so we, we, are, we are called Marxist scholars by people that think that, you know, we've heard, the, the online chatter has been great. I mean, we were ripped apart by our national uh, uh, critics as well for, uh, for our pavilion. Um, so it rubs people wrong. Um, and I think that for me, um, you know, 25 years ago, I was very, I would have said I was very left of Marx. <laughs> like, that capitalism is the, is the enemy, and, it, and I still feel that way, but I feel like also, um, yeah, how can you even project, like the, the projects I'm showing at the end, who's supplying all our stuff? Everything is part of a system where people are making money off of things, and it's like we're kind of in a tsunami of it. Um, you know, Fred, I, some of my earlier work in science fiction talks a little bit more about this. You know, I've always been inspired by F Frederick Jameson who wrote about, you know, I, the, the takeaway I had from Jameson was like, we can imagine up the apocalypse. Like we can all imagine the fact that we're either gonna nuke ourselves to death or destroy our planet and we're all gonna die, but we can't imagine another system than capitalism. Like we just have given in that this is the norm. 
And I think like there's, you know, there's a lot of great research out there now that's, and part of this indigenous teaching is to start to dismantle that. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of a bigger project than I think I can tackle in, in, in this lecture. But yeah, I would love, if you have solutions, let's dismantle it. <laughs> Maybe if there's time is there for time one more for question. Is there another question waiting? Sure, I'd love that. Oh, one. Mason, okay. sorry. <laughs> Is this the new way of looking? Um, <laughs> binoculars. Um, David, thank you so much for the talk uh, this evening. I was wondering, as an educator, practitioner, ex exhibitions, um, all the range of work that you do, publishing, writing, I'm wondering if you can reflect on the role that um, infrastructure plays, because it seemed like a lot of the work that you were presenting was actually more innovative with regard to mechanical infrastructure, economic infrastructure, or even material infrastructure, like the way in which building materials you talked about, you know, the lumber, where the lumber might be coming from. And I'm wondering if there's some lessons we can take from that in institutions, in educational institutions, that are we teaching architecture maybe front-facing rather than looking at the systems by which that sustain architecture or architects. And I was thinking about David Foster Wallace's description of two fish passing by an older fish and the older fish says, great water we're swimming in today. You know, the, isn't the water nice? And then the two fish keep swimming along and the one fish says to the other, hey, what's water? And this kind of realization that, um, you know, a, as elders and learning from elders is often about seeing the things you can't see. And the thing that we, from, certainly from AHA's work and um, it's very powerful just even ambitiously doing 10, 10 sort of propositions and 10 um, uh, demands, uh, it's a great word, demand, is they're all demands about the water and not about, they're all about the environment, they're all about the systems that sustain it, capitalism being one of them. Um, is there something that we should be doing different in architecture schools, both as the education of the architect or are, is this a blind spot in our discipline where we're not participating as much in the systems and instead it trickles down to us and you pointed out and we're very forthcoming about your $15 million home that was the last internship uh, project that you worked on, which was really honest to put in a project in, in a presentation about this. But um, I guess I'm wondering wh where do you, should we be uh, rebuilding or carving out space for um, innovative thinking with regard to the systems that support architecture as an acts of injustice and alienation? Well, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question. I don't know if I have a really great answer for it. I think one of the things that I've always felt was that we often uh, work in silos far too much, you know? Like, we've all had that moment where you, sit, uh, you hear an engineer talk about something and you think, wow, that's genius. <laughs> like, why didn't I? Like, I think the thing is to recognize that architects aren't everything and that there are so many people doing such incredible work in other fields. Like, that's really core to like for, and again, I'm not Anishinaabe, but core to Anishinaabe teachings is that idea of like the diversity of the forest, the health of the forest re revolves around all of us doing everything. And I think designers sometimes get a little bit ahead of ourselves thinking we, we're going to be able to solve everything, but certainly building awareness by collaborating. Like I've, I've never understood why we don't have more biologists. And we, we actually had a talk here a few years ago about the, the meaning of design school. I thought that was very interesting in that way, but I don't know. We're not getting very far, I don't think. Um, but I think absolutely, I think I, for me, when I'm talking about infrastructures, in fact, I was just in Melbourne last week talking about m infrastructures of life. They had a, a, an event over there um, exactly on this theme that you're talking about. Um, and you know, some of the things that come on, it's just so obvious that, you know, a woman was speaking from Indonesia saying, they deal with floods on a daily basis in Indonesia. And then there's all these tactics to like, you know, how do you deal with the flood? How do you communicate? Do you, what can you build all these levees and things? And it's like, the river's just breathing. Like the, that river has breathed for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. And we decided to build there because we liked that, <laughs> put a permanent building there. Like it's the perversity of our infrastructure in many ways. Uh, is very limiting. So I think like, yes, questioning it all and trying to think about how you deconstruct it. Um, and then the other thing that, that again, I've written, written about is, is the infrastructure of education itself and how we teach. And, and so that I, I've published an essay called The Design Lodge, which is a critique of studio, which I actually think studio 
is not a good word anymore. I used to think it was, but I never really thought about it. But I'm presenting, pres like, what, how does one design differently in a design lodge uh, where you have sort of teachings and an embedded knowledge of place? as opposed to being in the neutrality of a design studio, which is always trying to accommodate itself to everybody, everything else. So I think there's a whole bunch of questions about infrastructure and architectural education that are, that are needed, but I also think they're happening. Like every school I go to, it's amazing to see how many interesting scholars are in each program. I know a number of them here that are challenging and challenging, so it's part of that patience game too. But um, yeah, I think that's why I like the aha thing is like, I think there's, the world needs both. We need like fists in the air, change it now, and then we also need to be like, take a deep breath and be like, okay, it's gonna take us 50 years <laughs> to actually do that. But you know, we need a balance of both that we can't have just one. Thank you, thank you, David. And uh, thank you everybody for coming here tonight. Uh, it was very thank nice you. to have you. Thank you very much. Um, Uh, just before everybody goes, I just want to, oh, no, I'm still here. Uh, what's, ca what's happening next week uh, on Thursday at 6.30 again, um, November 30th, wildfire expert John Jonas Suskin will be here in the main hall to deliver his lecture, Landscape Strategies for a Fire-Prone Planet. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to also remind you all that uh, our exhibition towards home will remain on view in our gallery downstairs in the Architecture and Design Gallery. And it's open from Monday through Friday from 9 to 5 p.m. Uh, otherwise, please join us in the, um, in the commons for some snacks. <laughs> <laughs>